Well, I want to welcome you to our final session, the fourth of four sessions, on angels, the angelic realm, and specifically the invisible war we find ourselves in. But we started, as you may remember, with angels. Part one, we had the angelic realm in general. But we started the whole series by emphasizing um, that the Berean challenge to set aside our misconceptions. That's often the toughest part in addressing any topic like this. And so we, taught, we d tried to dismiss our misconceptions about angels. But what's probably even more important to set aside our misconceptions of our physical reality. And it was pursuant to that that uh, we spent quite a bit of time on just pointing out that the, the physical reality that we find ourselves in is a simulation, is a virtual reality. It's actually a digital simulation. And so that was the first session, major emphasis on that. There's a piece of that first session that I left just as an addendum that we'll talk about here before we get started here in a moment. Then we went to the second session, which was on about biblical angels, not the angels you see on Christmas cards or that stuff, but the, what real biblical angels are, their characteristics and their limitations. And we talked about the specific lineup of uh, Gabriel and Michael. They have cl very clear job descriptions and so forth. And uh, that, those two sessions was part one. We are finishing part two, which deals with the invisible warfare we find ourselves in. What I, uh, session three was what I call the dark side. And that's where we uh, also had to set aside our misconceptions about the, the word Satan and hell and what, what do those things really mean. And uh, so we talked about Satan, his origin, his uh, agenda, and his destiny last time. And we also touched upon another strange topic uh, called hybrids, the Nephilim, where the uh, fallen angels somehow created hybrids in an attempt to corrupt the messianic line. So we went through, uh, we're not through with that topic, by the way. We're going to see modern day echoes of that, we believe. Uh, but that was session three last time. So we're in the last session, session four. And I'm going to just lump in this last session a number of practical considerations. But before we go anywhere else, I wanted to amend something from session one. And that's uh, a, an addendum about our metacosm. We decided the macrocosm is finite, not infinite. That's the big discovery of 20th century science. The microcosm is also finite. There's a limit to smallness. And from that, we define that we are in a, our virtual reality is a simulation. That's exactly what Scientific American highlighted in their article back in 2005, that the physical reality we experience is a shadow of a larger reality. And that's exactly what the Bible's presented all along. I want to talk a little bit more about the metacosm, that outside reality, if you will, before we go on, just as an addend addendum here. We then will go into demons and how they differ from angels, and we'll talk about the age of hybrids that's coming upon us that many people don't not realize yet, and uh, then we'll talk about some practical implications of all of this that that's gone on. So, But let's just get this little addendum first. There's talk among scientists today about the fact that we may be living in a holographic universe. And that really reflects the, the thoughts of a David Joseph Bohm, um, American-born British uh, quantum physicist who contributed heavily to theoretical physics, philosophy. And he was one of the uh, brains on the Manhattan Project, by the way, World War II. And uh, the, the, the main idea of a holographic universe really is attributed to him, the, that he was the one, he was a protege of Einstein, and he, tur he was one of the world's most respected quantum physicists. And uh, his work in plasma physics in the 50s was considered a landmark. He comes from the plasma background, which you can tie back to some of the things I highlighted back there. The whole idea that he noticed that plasmas, electrified gases, behave as organic holes. Millions and millions of particles seem to know what all the other particles are doing, is the point. And that, that preoccupied him. Uh, when he moved to Princeton in 1947, uh, continuing his work with Einstein there uh, on, a, on the behavior of oceans of particles, noting that they're highly organized overall effects and behaving as, as if they knew uh, what each of the untold trillions of them were doing. Strange idea. Because of his sense of import the importance of interconnectedness, um, as well as his years of dissatisfaction with the uh, inability of the standard theories to explain the phenomena they're dealing with, left him searching. Einstein was the same way. Einstein went to his death, frustrated over these same issues. While at Princeton, Bohm and Einstein developed a supportive relationship. 
shared their mutual restlessness regarding the strange implications of what was then current quantum theory. Bohm's interpretation of quantum physics indicated that at the subquantum level, location ceases to exist. All points in space become equal to all other points in space. And it was meaningless to speak of anything being separate from anything else. Physicists call that property non-locality, if you will. And uh, one of Bohm's startling suggestions is that the tangible reality of our everyday lives is really kind of an illusion, like a holographic image. And uh, see, underlying this is a deeper uh, order of existence, a vast and more uh, primary level of reality that gives birth to all to what we think of as objects. Bohm calls this deeper level of reality the implicate or enfolded order. The level of our existence he calls the explicate or unfolded order. Those are just his vocabulary indicating there's, there's two levels of existence here. To, to understand him a little better, he, say, he suggests the universe is really a hologram. Let's take a look at a hologram. I might mention, I had personally had the opportunity uh, to visit Emmett Leith. He's the scientist that took the concept of, holo uh, of a hologram and added the technology of a laser to create three-dimensional photography uh, in his laboratory at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. Back in 64, I actually had a chance to meet him there and, and uh, uh, visit him, him there when I was uh, back in that era. But anyway, holography is a very provocative transform. Let me see if I can communicate. If you take a, photo a piece of photographic film, you place in front of that a three-dimensional object, and uh, you flood a laser beam on that photographic uh, plate, and at the same time also put an object beam on the art article, what gets recorded on the photograph, there's no lenses there, by the way, what gets recorded on the photographic film is the interference, if you will, of the two waves. The reference beam and the object beam commingle there to give what mathematically is a Fourier transform of the image. When you take that film and process it, you think it looks like a darkroom mistake. It looks like just a gray piece of film. Until you shine the reference beam on that thing and that piece of film becomes a window into a three-dimensional world. And so what you do here, the, 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 the plate becomes a Fourier transform of the image. And what happens if you look at that plate, in just no natural light you don't see anything. When you, when you hit it with a laser that created it in the first place, you actually see a three-dimensional image. Let me give you an example of what I mean. If uh, I was sitting up here and you took a photograph of me from the front, you couldn't tell what kind of a tie I was wearing. But if you took a hologram of me, you could move your eye over here and look around this and see my tie. That's what I mean by being a three-dimensional image. And that's the phenomenal, and there's lots of interesting properties of a hologram. I won't get, that, get to that all here. We've got other things to do. But what's interesting here is that that window, that hologram, becomes a window into a three-dimensional world of some kind of whatever, whatever you want it to represent. I'll come back to that in a minute. So it's interesting that uh, this I many, phys many physicists are skeptical of Bohm's ideas. And uh, among those who are sympathetic are some of the most the brightest thinkers in science. Roger Penrose of Oxford, creator of the modern theory of black holes, is sympathetic to Bohm's view. Uh, Bernardus Esprit of uh, Paris, one of the leading authorities on conceptual foundations of quantum theory. And perhaps most interesting, Brian Josephson, the winner of the 1973 uh, the Josephson Junction and so forth. He's a very famous physicist. In fact, um, he, ha he has, um, uh, Josephson believes that Bohm's implicate order may someday even lead to the inclusion of God within the framework of science, a view which Josephson supports. That in itself is a surprising posture of a guy of his stature in, in physics. But moving on, I want to tell you about a project that's going on in Germany as we speak. And it's called the GEO 600. Most people in physics are all enamored with what's called the Large Hadron Collider. We talked about that in session one. This is a different deal. This is in, in Germany, and uh, there's a search for gravity waves. They're trying to find gravity waves. And uh, these are extremely small ripples in the fabric of space-time. And so um, they were predicted by Einstein back in 1916, but they've never been directly observed, and that's what they're trying to do, is find out do these things really exist or not. And it, it aims at the direct detection of gravitational waves by an interferometer, a very strange one. Now, um, this instrument and its associated detectors 
are one of the most sensitive gravitational detectors ever designed. They're designed to detect relative changes in distance on the order of 10 to the minus 21. In other words, about the size of a single atom compared to the distance of the Earth to the Sun. If you can get some grasp of the, 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 the spread of sensitivity, it's, in, it's, in, it's incredible. Well, it uh, turns out, uh, and I won't get into the mechanics here either, they've been working on this for some years, obviously, but uh, in January of 2009, it was reported to the New Scientists that some yet unidentified noise was present in the GEO 600 detector. And they're beginning to suspect that this might be s s due to some quantum uh, fluctuation of space-time. And it was th the one of the scientists from Fermilab in Illinois that wrote a letter to him that suggested that might be uh, fluctuations might have been motivated by holographic principle. It may be that the GEO 600 has discovered something far more valuable than what they were looking for, if that's true. And uh, apparently the gravitational wave detector in Hanover may have detected a holographic universe. This may be a, con it turns out this might be a confirmation of Bohm's ideas. Can the GEO 600 hear quantum noise of space-time is the question. And uh, are we living in a holographic universe is the fundamental question. This pulls the rug out of from most of what we think about astronomy and elsewhere. Is space and time grainy in a sense? Is, the, is quantum noise in space-time is the point. That means that distance galaxies may be nothing more than an illusion. We already know that the galaxies beyond our solar system are not gravitationally linked. They're electrical in the first place. That was the big discovery that we covered in our study about Beyond Newton and all that. So if this hologram, if the universe is a hologram, it's like a window in a virtual three-dimensional space. So the things that we see in the outer regions may be virtual, not real. The distances in a hologram are synthetic, not real. And so that changes everything. The whole field of astronomy is on quicksand, in a sense. If, to the extent that uh, this may tr that, that Bohm's perceptions are on the mark here, so is there a literal fulfillment coming? You know, the Scripture says a strange verse, Mark 13, Matthew 24, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Most of us take those phrases idiomatically. We can't really visualize all the stars in the universe falling. On the Earth, that just, uh, that, that's, that's, that's a, an anachronism in the modern thinking, unless Bohm is right. You see, that, that could be very literally occurring. It's just a possibility. Well, having said all that, let's go ahead and uh, go jump into the rest of the real meat of uh, session four. I want to talk about demons and their agenda and the age of hybrid that's coming and then some practical stuff for all of us. Let's talk about demons. That's a term we use very loosely, biblically. One of the secrets in Bible study is to be very precise. And demons are not the same thing as angels. And so we want to get a, want to understand their limitations and we also want to understand their agenda. What are these creatures? Are they just idioms for what we consider psychiatric illusions? Or are they sentient real beings is the question before us. Well, we want to understand their capabilities and limitations and we want to see how they contrast with angels, fallen or otherwise. And uh, we w if so, we want to understand our need for what I call spiritual hygiene. And so we're going to talk about the encounter at Gadara on the east side of the Galilee. A very st there have been a number of occasions where demons are encountered in the New Testament. And they're very consistent in many respects. But the most illuminating one is what happened at Gadara. So we'll take it as the, our exemplar here. And it's recorded in Mark, in, in Mark 5 and Matthew uh, 8. We'll take the Mark account, it gets a little more detailed. Uh, Mark chapter 5, starting at verse 1. And they came over to the other side of the sea, unto the country of the Gadarenes. And by the way, some of the other Gospels make reference with a slightly, Gazarenes or Gergesenes, those are all different manuscripts, have slightly different ways of designating the same area, by the way, so don't let that throw you. And, uh, and also, the Matthew account speaks of two guys there, but Mark focuses on one specific of the two. So there's a debate among scholars, are those two different incidents? No, it's probably just that one is a, fo it's a different focus, which is really a corroboration, by the way, of the, of the record records. But let's go on here. 
And they came over to the other side of the sea, unto the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come, that Jesus that is, when he was come up out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because he, that, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. So this is a tough hombre. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? That's a startling an announcement from the demon, because he hadn't announced that yet. This is, early in his, this is only Mark 5. It's early in his ministry. He said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. According to Jesus, of course. Now, if we, look, if we switch to the Matthew account, this is one verse I want to pick out of the Matthew account because it records it slightly differently. It says, And behold, they cried, they, there were more to them, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? There's a subtlety in the Matthew account that highlights something. They apparently understood they had a destiny of ending, and they just felt it was too soon. The fact that they had a sense of a destiny is provocative here. They have a knowledge that they're evidencing here, is my point. But let's, okay. What are we to do with Jesus, the Son of God, and so forth? So they identify who he actually is, and they are aware of their own destiny. So this is not some kind of psychiatric problem here. And he asked him, what is thy name? Jesus asked him, what is thy name? And he answered, saying, my name is Legion, for we are are many. And we're going to discover how many are there shortly. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. Now understand, this is on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. That's the Decapolis. That's a a Greek area. Otherwise you wouldn't find swine being herded in the Jewish area. But this is a very Greek Hellenized area. So there were swine being herded there. And all the devils, there's a plurality of them here involved, all the devils besought him saying, send us into the swine that we may enter into them. Strange situation. These demons are requesting permission to enter the swine. Now your first question is, okay, why? But even more so, why did Jesus give them permission? And my presumption is in order to demonstrate to us that they're real. This is not an illusion. This is not a a hallucination of the the tormented guy. And so, uh, anyway, we go on here. And forthwith, Jesus gave them leave. And that mystifies many scholars. Why did he give them leave? Well, anyway, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea and were choked in the sea. And there's a little parenthesis here. There were about 2,000. That's a lot of demons. That's a lot of demons. The demons obviously have no volumetric constraints. Um, And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. They were terrified. See, they knew about this guy and to realize that change, that disturbed them, obviously, understandably. And they that saw it told him how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And what did the owners of the herds say? They began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. They wanted him out of town. And on the one hand, you can be critical of that. On the other hand, you can understand it. That's their livelihood. I want to focus on the declaration of the demons here. They announced what was not known at that time. They acknowledged his deity. They recognized his deity. They knew who Jesus was. 
He also knew their own destiny. And they also knew he had control of it. That tells us a great deal. That tells us that these creatures are sentient, have personalities, have issues. This is not a uh, fabrication. It's not a, a, um, an idiom for psychiatric uh, uh, problems here. Demons are different than fallen angels. Fallen angels can materialize. Okay, we'll get back to that in a minute. Demons are under Satan's control and are some of his resources. They are malevolent. They are dangerous. And if you're not a Christian, you are vulnerable to them. They are not simply some kind of psychiatric disorder. It's a mistake to come to that conclusion. And someone who's properly trained in psychiatry will spot the difference and handle it accordingly. I've been in those situations. It's also interesting to realize that the demons couldn't even indwell an animal without permission. That's provocative. There's some, there's some comfort in that. And, uh, now the nature of angels, this is a review from our previous session in session uh, 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 two. N- they usually appear in human form and they're usually mas- obviously always masculine. Sodom and Gomorrah is a good example. At the resurrection and the ascension we always see the, a duet giving t- testimony. Uh, they spoke, they took men by the hand, they ate meals. Angels can materialize. Demons can't. That's one of the big distinctive differences. Angels are capable of direct physical contact. That's what the Passover in Egypt was all about. That's what the slaughter of the 185,000 Syrians that we looked at in session two was all about. Jacob wrestled with one of these, so they, they can be tangible. They don't marry, that is in heaven, they don't marry. And, that, uh, and when they're unfallen. Don't, let's not limit the technology available to fallen angels. That's a whole other subject. In contrast with demons, demons are powerless without a host body. They're always seeking uh, embodiment. When they do have a host, they have superhuman strength. And I've witnessed that. They know their destiny. We saw that and that's why we picked the one from Gadara because it it, it illuminates a great deal of that. Some people suspect, we don't know this, but there's a very commonly held conjecture among some of the scholars that they represent the disembodied Nephilim. We know that the hybrids were created in Genesis chapter 6 and they drowned in the flood. But what happened to their spirits? The disembodied spirits are ineligible for resurrection according to a passage in Isaiah. And so we suspect that the Demons are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim of Genesis 6 and following. But that's a speculation. There's no way to really uh, nail that biblically. That's a speculation. But they do require permission for whatever they do, even entering animals. And uh, they, uh, that leads to a topic which what's called in the trade an entry. Individually, the, the demons need an entry to inhabit us. And we inadvertently may grant them an entry through our volitions. And that's why certain kinds of practices are dangerous because they can open the door for entries. To give you one of the best examples, William Blatty wrote a novel called The Exorcist. And uh, my, my dear friend Walter Martin set out to dis- debunk him and was shocked to discover when he did his homework that William Blatty had done his homework, that his novel, The Exorcist, was based on a several key case studies in New Jersey. It was a boy, not a girl, in the real one, but the point is, Blatty had done his homework. And uh, Walter was quite startled to realize that he had done his homework. Um, But the point is, that whole episode started with a kid fooling around with a Ouija board. And that constituted an entry. And so we need to recognize lowering the gate of your volition can be dangerous. And we want to understand that as we go here. So... What can be an entry? Occult games, occult uh, practices. That's why it's dangerous to dabble in the occult. It's not harmless superstition. It can be entries. That's what makes Halloween such a dangerous holiday in certain parts of the world. Um, Role-playing games can be dangerous. Seances, participating in a seance can be dangerous. And any kind of false worship and so forth. There's a whole, we'll get into some of these things later here. There's another strange thing about demons that's 
less certain but provocative, and that the territoriality. You would think a spirit being would not be limited geographically, but there's biblical hints that they have zones of influence, and that's an enigma. Question, what does the Golan Heights, Hebron, and the Gaza Strip have in common geographically? These are all areas that Joshua failed to exterminate the Rephaim in. There were four tribes that he was instructed in Joshua 15 and elsewhere to wipe out every man, woman, child of certain tribes. When you read that as a New Testament reader, you're shocked. But that's what he was supposed to do, and he didn't quite finish in several areas. In fact, these areas. If you do a study of Joshua and Judges, you'll notice there are certain strongholds that Israel failed to defeat completely. And they were the Galan, they were the area we call the West Bank, and an area called Gaza. And Janine, Nabulus, and Rolla. In fact, Jericho means the house of the moon god, and that's the capital of the PLO, by the way. The moon god, which of course is the worship uh, centroid of Islam. And uh, so, these are territories that remain in spiritual dispute to this very day. Very provocative. Is there a linkage? Who knows? We'll, have to go, we'll move on here. When Jesus is hanging on the cross, as recorded in Psalm 22, he says, Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have set, have set me round. Scholars wonder what on earth is the, certainly not talking about literal bulls of the Galan up there, no. Uh, the, word, b- b- the word there in the Hebrew mean, it can be used of men, angels, or animals. It's also metaphorically of enemies or princes or objects, and it may be demon. It's my presumption that it probably is alluding to demon hosts that are surrounding the cross during his ordeal. But I want to switch now to another topic that we can't even begin to summarize in a brief survey, but I'd be, I'd be remiss by not including it in some sense. And that's an age that's coming upon us that the secular world will be calling the age of the hybrids. What are they talking about? Are they including UFOs? Probably not, but I'm going to include them in our review here. And I want to talk about technology convergences that are accelerating and are going to impact our total society here in a matter of a few years, not a few decades. And uh, I want to talk, what do they mean when they talk about the transcendent man? What's all that about? First of all, let's talk about UFOs. Jesus said, as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. We can't really understand what he's talking about unless we understand what the days of Noah were all about. And we get that all in Genesis 6. And Genesis 6 is all about these strange hybrids that the fallen angels had uh, contrived. So, is it possible whatever was going on in Genesis 6 apparently will characterize the, second, the time of the second coming of Christ? That's, that's his remark. And so, there are interdim- when you get to UFOs, there's a basic, basic problem in that they follow, um, they, they leave physical evidences. The burnt ground, radiation, some, they leave physical, they also show up on multiple radars simultaneously. So they have some kind of physical existence on the one hand. On the other hand, they violate physics laws. They make right angle turns at high speeds, they go faster than the speed of sound without sonic booms. They're a mystery in that regard. And that contradiction is what has puzzled scientists all along. And then we also, whenever I'm in a large audience and there's an open question and answer, because Dr. Mark Eastman and I published a book on alien encounters, we're well known in that area, people always ask, what really happened at Roswell? Something very, very strange happened at Roswell, New Mexico, back in uh, uh, 1946 and 47 time period. And uh, now the problem with Roswell is several fold. The Air Force issued one after another after another of cover stories that are so flagrantly phony that that just made it worse because they kept l- issuing these bizarre cover stories that were clearly lies. And uh, again and again and again, that, f- that fed people wondering what on earth really happened at Roswell. Let me tell you the real mystery. The, the stories that were that there were some alien aircraft, the cra- uh, excuse me, there was an alien craft that landed with several bodies in it. One was still alive. They, they, they sealed the area off and shipped all that to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base into the deep security that was surrounded it. Now, what's so st- what really happened at Roswell is the most common question. I get what, two presidents and four congressmen have built their careers trying to break that and have not been able to break the security that surrounds The mystery of Roswell is why 
to this very day, that area enjoys a security classification that's higher than our most sensitive warheads. The question is why? You can't get an answer to that, and that's really been attacked a number of different ways. But what makes this more complicated is that we had a very interesting thing occur. Uh, there was a, the, one of the first press releases by the Air Force was by uh, uh, General Ramey. Uh, uh, he had a press conference where he denounced the fact that this was an aircraft, you know, a whatever, and the press was there. Well, it turns out the press took some pictures, and that was in 47. Well, a few years ago, a guy, a researcher by the name of David Rudiak, was able to get hold of those negatives from the newspaper and put digital enhancement on them. And it turns out that while General Ramey was having his press conference, he was clutching a, men, a, a, a crumpled paper in his hand. And it was possible by digital enhancement to read some of the phrases on the memo that was in his hand. And they could read the victims of the wreck and the disc they will ship. A couple of phrases came out of them. So the point was it was clear that Ramey was holding a confirmation that he was denying in the press conference. Some people call that the smoking gun. So what we, all we really know is the Air Force was lying through their teeth. Something weird was going on that they were trying to cover up. And to this day, there's been one cover up after another, and each one is sillier than the previous one, which just makes the whole situation worse. But that leads to another issue that I'm going to talk about briefly so you can understand something here. There was a group called Majestic 12 that surfaced in the consciousness of the researchers. Uh, apparently, it appears that Harry Truman, president at the time, in 1946, signed a memo empowering 12 people, six civilians and six military, into a commission called Majestic 12, 12 people, and he assigned them the responsibility to deal with this whole UFO area, to research it and, and so forth. Well, the Majestic 12 gets called MJ-12 before long. But a few years go by, and the memo that Harry Truman signed, and some very elaborate military manuals that deal with the handling and disposition of alien corpses surface in the community. And it isn't very long before people realize they're phonies, that the memo signed by Truman was a forgery, a, a signature taken off some other document, and there's also some other details that they quickly the research community discovers that MJ-12 is baloney. Today, there's only two kinds of people, those that never heard of it, and those that know it's a hoax. And I mention this because of some background that I don't want to get into here in this brief review, but there is evidence that MJ-12 really does exist in a different name. And uh, the point I want to make, if you've, I've spent 30 years in the classified community, and one of the tricks they do, if you're trying to hide something, you let surface some materials pointing to it, surface, that are phony. People quickly find out they're phony, and that discredits the existence of what you're trying to hide. And that's called disinformation. It's a very, very uh, skilled technique, widely used within the classified, in the covert ops community. So you just need to understand that. For reasons I don't want to detail here, it doesn't mean I'm correct, but I'm convinced MJ-12 does exist and still exists today under other names. And so you just, uh, that, that's, that's my, my, uh, my vindication of that is the fact that the whole area of Roswell is still to this day classified. It's been over 60, uh, going on 70 years ago. Why? What can be, why can't that be told? And it's, well, it's very, very well hidden. And so this leads to another area that's very complicated, and that's the area of people that have apparently had abduction experiences. And this is a very complicated area to try to deal with. I don't want to get into it positive. I just want you to be aware that it is a serious area. Travis Walton was one example of this. They even made a movie. Uh, there's also a, a, there's a number of other of these abduction stories. I can remember when, I pub when Mark Eastman and I published our book, Early Encounters, that I received a phone call from Hollywood. A guy by the name of Tracy Torme called me and says, Chuck, I heard your radio broadcast. There was radio broadcast at the time on our book and so forth. He says, I heard you, on your, and I happen to know a lot about your area, and you're right on the mark until you made a mistake. You said that Christians cannot be abducted. And I happen to know a lot about this area, he claimed, because I was in a project there, and you need to check the Betty Andreessen affidavit as an example. Well, I was so startled to get a phone call like that, and I did check into it, but the Betty Andreessen story is one in which 
these creatures, whatever they were, invited her and she accepted their invitation. That's a technicality, but that's not an abduction. Not in terms of the definitions. So, t- but it's interesting, I, d- I later found out that Tracy Torme was one of the producers of the movie Fire in the Sky, which James Garner was the FBI agent. They, 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 they dramatized the story as, as has been, it's, it's a documented, it's a movie, but it's, it, uh, it, it's behind the documentation. Anyway, enough of this. Dr. John Mack, who's the head of psychiatry for Harvard Hospital, co-chaired a, a commission on abductions at MIT. And uh, uh, well attended, and his challenge to the audience was, he said, there's over a thousand of these episodes. He had over 200, he dealt 176 that he dealt with personally. He says, what the, these people are above average intelligence, had no psychiatric history, clearly subject to some kind of trauma, and very anxious to hide what happened. They, are, they, they don't want the embarrassment of the disclosure. So they're not looking for publicity. He says, but they have consist- this, there's consistent aspects to their stories that are they're too bizarre to accept, but they're too consistent to ignore. And his challenge to the conference was is if what these people are saying are happening isn't happening, what is? Because of the widespread use. It is a well-known serious problem within that community. So for what it's worth. It's still unresolved, obviously, but I want you to be aware of it. The two most respected researchers in this area, Jacques Vallée, uh, he's a, he was a, a Frenchman, venture capitalist, computer scientist, astronomer, what have you. Uh, this is a picture of he and J. Allen Hynek. Uh, uh, in mainstream science, Vallée is notable for co-developing the first computerized mapping of Mars for NASA and for his work on the SRI, uh, on ARPANET, which is of course the precursor to modern internet. So he's a respected researcher in his own right. He's also a very important figure in the study of UFOs, first noted uh, for def- a defense of the scientific legitimacy of the extraterrestrial hypotheses, and later for promoting the interdimensional hypotheses. I'm going to come to that. These guys have devoted their life to trying to unravel what on earth is going on with the UFOs. And the other guy is J. Allen Hynek. He was a, a professor at Ohio State, and he acted as scientific advisor to the Air Force on three consecutive inna- things, Project Sign, Project Grudge, and Project Blue Book, which were the official attempts to, to get some net around the UFO world. And for decades after those, he conducted his own research. And it, what I'm getting at is these two guys, the two most respected guys in the research world, Jacques Vallée and J. Allen Hynek, both of them came to some interesting conclusions. They point out that real evidence survives the screening of the, fa- there's so much false data and hoaxes and other nonsense you've got to p- dig through, but when you finally do, there are, there's real evidence for real, and some of that, by the way, is classified. There's 432 studies of just formation flying of these things. The physical evidence, on the one hand, violating physical laws, and the other, that's the contradiction that everybody's struggling with. It was Jacques Vallée and J. L. Hayek's mutual conclusion that they're interdimensional, not intergalactic. They don't come from some other galaxy. There's easy ways to dismiss that. But they are interdimensional because the the mystery is where are they when you're not seeing them, okay? And they have an agenda of deceit which caused both Valet and Hynek to conclude that they're demonic, their terms. I don't know their spiritual condition. I have no insight into their understanding of the metacosm per se. But it's interesting that they both, from their conclusions, determined that they were demonic in their origin, partly because of their, their commitment to deceit. So, I want to now shift a little bit. There are some technologies that are advancing so fast, it's startling the people in the fields, and there's four of them that have this in common. Genetics and microbiology is then one of the major frontiers of science, making a lot of, a lot of progress. The other one is robotics. The thing that has held up robotics is not muscles. They've now got 100, 101 power, more powerful muscles. They don't use hydraulics for years anymore. But the problem with uh, robotics is uh, skin. They now have a synthetic skin that can feel the footprint of a fly. And so robots can sense whether it's a wine glass or a bowling ball they're picking up. Follow me. So that's, robotics is making huge advances. The other one is nanotechnologies. These are people that are trying to make machines the size of molecules primarily as vehicles to deliver medicine in your body. They can have a 10,001 improvement in attacking cancer by developing a robot that goes to the cancer cell specifically to administer the thing. That's having huge, huge possibilities. Very, very exciting area going on in nanotechnologies. But the last one is artificial intelligence. That's a field of study that's making huge advances. Each one of these 
fields of technology are advancing very, very rapidly, and they're all heading in a very strange direction, okay? They're moving into a direction that's called transhumanism. If you can create a limb for someone that has lost a limb, you make a synthetic limb, electronic, whatever, it's now possible to make one that's vastly better than the one he lost, connected to his neural system, and so on. And so they're beginning to, there's other technologies that are all converging to create the super being, especially the idea of a super soldier. I'll come back to that, okay? What are the aspirations and priorities of these four technologies? And it's in the direction of transhumanism. And there are dangers, of course. There are dangers that our most brilliant scientists are not aware of because they have no spiritual insight at all. Their egos and their PhDs, whatever, are in a way of them under having the humility to understand there is a God who created us in the first place. And he has some rules. Machine enhancements. You know, it's interesting that we now can make arms and things that are superior to the ones you've lost. Okay, and hands and whatever. The, the technology is moving so fast that these can be advantageous. Bionic muscles. There's muscles that can be a hundred times stronger than one you have on. Not with gears and things, but literally with, with uh, synthetic muscles. And we, we don't have to get into the details here. I'm drawing from some trans, uh, beyond humanism things that we've been dealing with. There's also limb to brain communication going on. Robotic limbs have limited motions and the user can't feel what he is touching it. But robotics is changing that because they can use optical fibers so to communicate to the, so the brain knows what he's touching. And that they're, they're advancing that. And uh, uh, we can go into the details. Nanotechnology, perhaps the most astonishing one, building machines that are as small as a molecule is what they're trying to do. And uh, so they're in nanometers and so forth, and, and I won't get into the details here, except they have huge, huge implications, especially in the field of medicine. But let's go to the, the, the queen of them all, and that's artificial intelligence, blurring the distinction between man and machine by electronically connecting to brains and trying to understand how the signals take place. We're creating artificial intelligence. We, there are research going on in brain scans. At, uh, at Princeton, for an example, giant steps going forward in the computer mind reading. They're, going, they're, making, they're researching this area. They, they're starting to understand the patterns of signals in your brain and trying to correlate that to what you're thinking about. And that, that's just beginning, but they're making progress in that area. In fact, there are now commercial companies that manufacturing headsets for games that do nothing more than read your brain waves. And they, that's a commercial market. There's companies that make these things that are commercial products. And there this, this one uh, mindset one is, is used by over 300 universities. These things only cost a couple hundred dollars. And you can play around and, and read your brain waves and try to learn something from them. And so they, they, uh, they are, uh, there's, a whole, there's a whole field of study there that's reached retail levels, strangely enough. And uh, it's interesting that um, the uh, higher... Uh, uh, the TV company in China has announced a TV set that's now on the market in which you can change channels by thinking about them, by wearing one of these headsets. You can connect to your TV electronically. The Army has mind control projects uh, they, to try to develop thought helmets. The concept is that they could harness silent brainwaves for secure communication among the troops. And uh, the UCI at, uh, in, in Orange County and Carnegie Mellon and University of Maryland have, have c contracts in this area to move in this direction. And so the brain-to-computer interface, BCIs they call them, brain-to-computer interfa interfaces, is a whole world uh, in which guys create a synthetic limb and they operate the limb over the internet where the hand the guy's operating is in another state. They do that just to demonstrate that it's all electronic kind of thing. And the BCIs, and there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in that area. They now have computers that learn. IBM has unveiled experimental computer chips that are brain inspired, that is they, they take multiple inputs, not just the typical I.O. devices. And uh, the, the, the aim is for the device to learn, to improve its own behavior. And they're going through all that. Uh, IBM is teaming with uh, 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 3M to layer chips. So by just layering that, they can pick up a thousand to one speed advantage because of the distance if they can get rid of the heat and they're finding ways to do that. So they're, you're going much, much faster. And so we could go on and on about this. But the key idea in the, is the field of artificial intelligence. 
the power of computers continues to excel. Each one of these technologies is advancing faster than it used to because they're all feeding each other in effect. The, 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 in computers, the size, energy, and cost are, con are plunging, getting cheaper and cheaper. The facility of software continues to accelerate and expand. There's a uh, 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 Ray Kurzweil, one of the writers in this area, adopted a mathematical term. I think it's inappropriate, but he uses the term singularity. He, he uses that to designate the point at which computers will exceed the human being in their capability. He calls that the singularity, and he thinks it's only a few years away. And uh, that's a, that he's the, it's a term he coined, uh, and his book called The Singularity is Near is a bestseller, and it's caused his, um, his story to be documented. It's a movie. It's in theaters now, and so forth. But the idea, the computational intelligence will exceed that of the human mind. The, what's the ultimate aspiration here? It may surprise you. That all sounds pretty good if it gets better and better. It's a tool we can use. Now, wait a minute. They want to exchange our consciousness with a machine that's superior to us. If they can do that, they can take that consciousness and put it back in a human body, but it can be a human body better than the one it left. Because they, they believe they're at a point where they can create a human body that's superior to the one that we have. Now the point being, if you can translate your consciousness into that machine, and then that from machine into another body, you've, re you've achieved immortality. There's no reason you can't live forever, it would seem. So they're literally pursuing that as a goal. And uh, that may shock us with our perspectives, it doesn't, it, but it's a, a major, major thrust in technology before us. And that would be a path to immor immortality. You also need to understand there's a group called the Jasons. This is highly classified, but it's around. You can check it out. It's an independent group of scientists that advises the United States government on matters of science and technology. Highly classified. They're about, uh, they're, they are 30 and 60, somewhere between 30 and 60 members. Highly classified projects, highly classified reports. You have to be in that community to understand what's really going on. But the point is there is an arms race going on, not just in the U.S., but in China and Russia, among others, to, comp to apply everything we think we've learned to create the super soldier. The concept is if you can create the super soldier, that could be a major, major uh, decisive advantage. So there's a highly classi classified priority agenda that's driving a global arms race as we speak. It's widely acknowledged among the informed that the next era that we're entering will be known as the age of the hybrids. And that's coming from the emergence of the following technologies, genetics, robotics, nanotechnologies, and artificial intelligence. And uh, super soldiers with ultimate weapons, network super leaders with unlimited mind controls, unenforced lawlessness among a privileged few, consciousness exchanges, offering a form of immortality, collective consciousness ushering in a utopian collective or the ultimate nightmare. Now, see the real you is software, call it soul, spirit, whatever, uh, your consciousness. You're temporarily resident in a disposable set of hardware called your hardware environment. And uh, why shouldn't that consciousness of its software be transform transferable to an alternative, perhaps advantageous environment? Even a machine enhanced environment. See, when these people are experimenting and they connect their mind to the machines, they're creating a two-way communication channel. Are they exposing themselves to demonic control? Absolutely. Are they sensitive to that? Of course not. So it's strange stuff we're dealing with here. And uh, what would limit a continuing path to subsequent upgrades? That's their argument. Okay. So here are the convergent nanotechnologies, molecule-sized machines. Robotics, self-modifying, sentient machines, machines that can be around the household with brains in them, if, if you will. Genetics, self-replication of manipulated entities, being able to create diseases that can target a specific individual. It's one of the goals. Directable diseases targeting specific groups or individuals. And of course, the queen of them all, artificial intelligence, eventually exceeding the human mind. What Kurzweil likes to call the singularity. Okay. The composite goal, self-replicating sentient machines, 
superior, perhaps overwhelming, combatant strengths. Transfer of consciousness between and to exterior bodies is one of their goals. A path toward immortality, as I pointed out. And a lure towards global tyranny. The person that can control these first. Can you imagine those techniques if they were available a few decades ago to another world dictator who had his ambitions? So we call this transhumanism, is the fear. It ignores the metacosm. People who are dealing with this have no grasp of the boundaries of our own reality. It's a supernatural warfare in which we are both the puppets and the prizes. We need to understand that. When we open up a communication channel into our software, call it soul, spirit, whatever, it yields an access permission that is not reversible. Like birth control, it's not retroactive. We also have an accountability. See, we understand that we have an accountability to the master designer himself. That's a, that's not, that's a personage that they don't, the most brilliant minds in these technologies don't even acknowledge for the most part. There may be some pleasant exceptions. So I'm now moving into the spiritual hygiene portion of this. And I want to talk about the armor of God. I want to talk about your vulnerability factors. I'm ex excerpting these from an appendix we put on our book called Alien Encounters. But just to give you a quick perspective. How are you vulnerable to the, the demonic presences? By some form of idolatry in the family background within the last four generations, if you, there's a number of verses that imply that. Is there, is there in your background? Most people don't know. Obvious examples of demonic regions such as Hindu, Buddhist, Native American, Voodoo, Scientology, New Age groups are all candidates here. Also parlor games such as Ouija boards, Dungeons and Dragons, role-playing games are all candidates here. And uh, don't overlook or dismiss the more subtle forms of idolatry such as rebellion, ar arrogance, immorality, impurity, greed, gluttony. Those are all exposures that increase your vulnerability to intervention. Sins of the mind where the person does not retain control over his thoughts, such as drug use, is an, is an open, is opening for demonic behavior. Transcendental meditation, occultism of any kind, hypnosis, uncontrolled anger are all openings, entries, if you will. A third area is attitudinal issues. We probably overlapped this a little bit. Excessive guilt and sorrow. Is list. These are all listed in the scripture. Pride and arrogance. Lack of uh, sexual self-control, lack of mental peace, disobedient to known truth, secular values, insolence to Christ, breaking marriage vows, casting off the early faith, being idle, a busybody, tattler. But these are all candidates from the text that you could also, we could argue, it proves your vulnerability. Volitional participation with demons or the spirit world in a non-biblical context. That's for sure. And people dabble in that unknowingly, unprepared. Okay, what are the remedial preparations you can do? Well, for one thing, is explicit renunciation of any or all of the above before the throne of God. If any of those things strike a chord with you, spend some time on your knees before the ruler of the universe and acknowledge that Christ has separated you from those. He's paid 100% of the price for, uh, thereof. There is a 24-hour hotline available to you at any time. It is accessible from the privacy of your own will through prayer. It's a form of trans-dimensional communication. And it's available to you at your, at your beck and call. A second preparation, ask to receive the benefits of the completed action of Jesus Christ in your behalf. He's done it all. You can't add to it. To try to add to it is blasphemy. But you can get on your knees and receive the benefits of what he's done for the asking. So that can give you insulation from any of those dark areas I just mentioned. And undertake a specific commitment to the serious study of the Bible as the inerrant Word of God. That's the way you, you empty the vessel of the darkness, fill it with the light, with the Lord, with the Word of God. Make a diligent effort to put on the whole armor of God, and I'll tell you what that is in, in a minute here. Spend time with God in prayer every day. That's a defensive act you can take to keep yourself separated from any demonic behavior. If you're praying to God, they flee. Identify and participate in a fellowship of Christian believers in which the teaching of the entire Bible receives the primary priority. Flee any cult groups that do not restrict their allegiance and authority to the Word of God and or deny the deity of Jesus Christ uniquely. 
Every cult group has that in common. They find some way to cloud the deity of Christ. When you find that, you split. You stay away from it. Okay, suppose you have an encounter. Gee, I saw a UFO in my backyard last night. What do you do? First of all, you reject any invitations, you deny any requests, and you flee any involvement. I had a very, very strange thing occur in Florida. A woman with a psychiatrist and her husband came because I was speaking on a related topic and they came to me afterwards and then we went to the, in this case I had a pastor I could trust. We all went into his office with him. It turned out she had a documented case of abduction. And I won't get into the details, it's not important. But I, I argue, and it had evidence of lesion. They actually had performed some experiments, there were evidence of it. And I, uh, but I advised them. I says, what you do with this documentation, you put it in a safety box and don't tell anybody. The only people that need to know about it is your pastor and your husband and your MD. Nobody else needs to know. If this gets out to the press, they will destroy your life because they're so hungry for examples of abductions with legion. That's the, there are people around searching for those kinds of things and they'll destroy your life. There's no need to get them involved. The only people that need to know is your husband and your, and your pastor. And that, I gave him that advice. I met them a year later and she was healthy and she accepted the Lord. There was a, there's more to the story. I'm not going to know all that here. But the point is, um, you flee involvement. Take command and plead the blood of Jesus Christ on your behalf. Remember that you have that command available to you. If you rely on Him, you are in a position of absolute authority. They'll try to bluff you. Don't let them. Don't allow yourself to be bluffed. He has complete control. Seek prayer and counsel from someone who clearly has an adequate biblical background. That's where your, res that's where your refuge is. Do not allow yourself to be hypnotized. That goes against the advice of many uh, practitioners, but I uh, personally encourage you to avoid that because I think it can be dangerous. And uh, this is a warfare. You are a target. The enemy's primary weapon is deception and deceit. The only thing you can rely on is the Word of God. Your primary weapon is the Word of God. And your armor is listed in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 18. And let's take a look at that as I wrap this up here. The armor of God, Ephesians 6. You don't have to remember the verses. You can just find it that way. It's very easy. Paul says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Boy, that sounds simple, doesn't it? Be strong. It's in the imperative mood. This is not an option. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. It's a command. It's in the present tense. Be continually strong. It's not a once for all kind of thing. It's in the passive voice. You receive the action here. In the power of His might. The power that overcomes resistance as in Christ's miracles and so forth. His might. God's, in, God's strength is what you need, and you tap that. That's your imperative here. How do you do that? You put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Put on the whole armor. Not your favorite pieces. There are seven elements you need to understand. The form of the Greek imperative, put on, indicates that believers are responsible for putting on God's, not their, God's full armor. The Panoplian. And it's his armor. You want to be completely armed. And, uh, and you want to do that when? Before the battle begins. But you're already on enemy turf. And here's the key verse that we want to keep in our minds that, that justifies this whole series of four sessions that we put together here. You and I, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual weakness in high places. Those are ranks of angels. That's what we're against. Not flesh and blood, guys. No, it's them. That's, the, that's what we're up against. The ranks of fallen angels and demons is what we're dealing with here. Wherefore, again, he says this a second time, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. And there it is, the whole armor again. All seven pieces. Be completely armed, he's asking, like he did earlier. And, uh, and uh, withstand and stand against, if you will. Now, Paul's armament list here, he has a detailed list of armor. Many people assume that, there, that he is writing this because he's chained to a Roman soldier at the time. He probably is, and that's fine. That's, the reason he is, that's so the soldier can't get away. 
Can you imagine standing a full shift chained to Paul? Many of them came to the, came to the Lord, we know from some of his letters. But the point is, the Holy Spirit is consistent in his use of idioms. These same elements are alluded to in the Old Testament, Isaiah 59 and other places. But let's go on. He says, now, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having a breastplate of righteousness. Now, this girt with truth, what, what do you mean? Girt? He starts with a belt. Why with a belt? See, what is truth? Remember, that's what Pilate so cynically asked. Uh, then. Truth is our most precious treasure ever coveted. Truth is the key to success, fulfillment, victory, or achieving any worthwhile goal. The pursuit of truth is our greatest challenge in any of our endeavors, and that's the thing that's denied in our educational system. Our educational system is degraded to the point where they deny the very existence of truth, and that was the goal of education from its very beginning. But um, the Roman belt, to give you a feeling here, was six to eight inches wide. All the body armor was linked to it. It's the core to it all. And I love my wife's definition of truth. She came across this, and I love it. When the word and the deed become one, that's truth. God promises it, and when he does it, it's true. And uh, the ultimate truth is the ful fulfillment of God's promises, and the ultimate ones, of course, is the Messiah himself. And it was prophesied of Christ that righteousness should be the girdle of his loins and the faithfulness of the girdle in his reins. That's literally drawn from Isaiah 11. But let's us move on here. And, and uh, what is your most important stewardship? Your wife will say your family. The guy will say the career. No, no, neither one's correct. Your most important stewardship is your own heart. That's your most important stewardship, your heart. And uh, having on the breastplate of righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness, the Roman breastplate was bronze backed with leather. The breastplate secured the vitals, your heart. And the breastplate covered the heart. So that's your, your the core zone, if you will. And uh, so... A blow through this was usually decisive. And so, and then he goes on, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, preparation of the gospel, shoes or greaves or whatever, are part of the military armor, and the use of them would defend feet against gall traps and other kinds of obstructions. If you're ever fighting with swords, by the way, if you lose your f footing, that your first slip is your last, usually. Preparation is the prerequisite to success in any endeavor, and that's really the focus here. Your feet shod with a preparation. You prepare for this. And above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now the shield of faith, the Roman shield was about four feet high and about two and a half feet wide, overlaid with linen and leather. It's designed to uh, absorb fiery arrows. The integrity of the shield was essential. The time to plug any holes was before the battle. If your shield of faith has holes in it, fix them now. If there's some problem, some concept that bothers you, chase it down, nail it down now. Don't let it haunt you later. Nail those things. Bef you do it before the battle. You don't repair your shield when the battle's already begun. You do it ahead of time. And so... Diligence was the key to proper maintenance. And your faith needs diligence. If there's problems, chase them down. And take the helmet of salvation. Now that's an interesting phrase, you see. The helmet provided protection for the head. And uh, a believer knows ultimate victory is sure. The assurance is a crucial blessing. One of the most important aspects of our defense against Satan's most vicious attacks is our firm faith in eternal security. That's not an optional doctrine. It's a prerequisite to your effectiveness. You need to be sealed and guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. You need to understand that. If there's any doubt about eternal security, I encourage you to do your homework, dig into that, and get that resolved so there is no doubt in your mind. That's just a fundamental. I love what Paul advises his protege, Timothy. He says, Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know in whom I believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. His confidence is in Christ, not in himself. Praise God. He, in fact, uh, Paul really wrote the, the book on eternal security with Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 31. What shall we say then of these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? 
Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who maketh intercession for us. And who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are, what? More than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, there they are again, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that's, and then he says, then he finally says, take the sword of the Spirit. Now all of us, I think, know that idiom refers to the Word of God. But there's some things you need to understand about the Roman sword. The Roman machaira was only 24 inches long. You know, it was common in those days to have a long sword, a long curved sword. That was typical. No, the Romans had a short 24-inch machaira with which they conquered the world. How did they do that? With this revolutionary innovation, they achieved legendary victories because it was short and sharpened on both sides and designed for close quarters. They could get in close quick. And uh, it did, however, require two things. Special training and extensive practice. And I suggest to you the same thing's true of the sword of the Spirit. It takes special training. I love to ask a group like this, how many of you could take a Jewish friend and present him the Jewish Messiah using only the Old Testament? That was done 12 different times by six different people throughout the book of Acts. When they said they showed him by the scriptures, they meant the Old Testament. How many of us could do that? Got a Jewish friend. Could you go through the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and show them their Messiah? It's not hard to do. It takes a little training. It takes a little outline, some awareness of that. The other thing it takes is extensive practice. Do you practice with your sword? Question. Okay. Christ employed his, this sword three times when he was tempted by the devil. That was what protected him three times in the famous temptations in, Mark, in uh, Matthew 4. And the scripture argues for hiding the word of God in your heart. That's an ad admonition of scripture memory. People say, gee, Chuck, you sure stick with the King James. Yes, I do. And I'm not sorry I do. Every translation has its problems. King James does too. The good news with King James, they're all well documented. You know where they are. The new ones are still discovering some. Why am I in the King James? Because it's better? No. I happen to like it better, but that's not the point. I'm glad when I was a kid I did my memory work in the King James. I'm glad I didn't do it in the RSV because that's fallen into this reason. If you do it in one of the modern translations, no problem. But you know that 10 years from now or whenever, some other one of the ISV, International Standard Version is coming out. And someday it'll, it'll be exceeded. That's fine. I want to do my memory work in a version that I know will be around and the majesty and the foundational posture of the King James will never be unseated. So that's, a, that's, an, that's a un, perhaps an unthought of little quirk, but I, that's one of the reasons I lean to it. And uh, so uh, the Word of God will preserve us from sin. It'll mortify and kill those lusts and corruptions that are latent there. Now let me get to the seventh one. This is the heavy artillery. It's the one I've seen it omitted on some people's list of the armor of God. They don't go one verse, one verse more. They miss the heavy artillery. One of the most important factors in a military engagement is proper ground support. Interdiction, flanking fire, and direct assaults. And uh, this goes beyond personal armor, yes. It's a form of trans-dimensional communication. We call it prayer. Most powerful tool you could have. The heavy artillery, the action at a distance weapon, prayer. You can participate in a ministry in the deepest jungles of South America by kneeling in your bedroom, holding up in prayer the, the missionaries that are there. You can participate in spiritual warfare anywhere in the world without leaving your bedroom. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Oh, that's the fake secret. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Praying always. Wow. See, with any supporting fire, coordination is vital. We all need to be supported by prayer warriors. If you're undertaking a project for the Lord, make sure you've got a prayer group specifically committed to you before you start. Essential. 
essential. In the Greek, the word all occurs four times in this verse. All prayer, all, all, all. It's four, in the Greek, it's four times. Continual, not sporadic. Like reliable soldiers, we are to be keeping diligent, literally, in all persistence. That's a strong term. It should be habitual, public and private. It should be deliberate and spontaneous, both. It should be supplication and intercession, both. It should be confession and humiliation, both. It should be praise and thanksgiving, and they're not the same thing. Check it out. Okay. And for me, he says, Paul continuing to the Ephesians, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly. What? Paul is praying to be more bold? Can you imagine? To make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. We probably stumble thinking that we want to, that Paul, that Paul needs to be more bold. He claims to be. He's praying that he would be. That I may open my mouth boldly. And uh, this recalls his lengthy discussion of the mystery of the gospel. And that's earlier in the, in the book of Ephesians. And for this reason, he was an ambassador in bonds and so forth. And for me, the utterance may be given unto me that I may be, may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And uh, because I am an ambassador in bonds. See, ambassador means taking the name of the king. That's one thing. That's why our third leg of our school in the institute is motivated by the third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, which we argue has nothing to do with vocabulary or swearing. No, 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 no. Taking the name of the king is taking the name as his ambassador. If you're going to take the name of the king, you need to be prepared to represent him competently and faithfully. And that's what you should be training for. That's your calling. No matter what, you're, what else you're doing, if you're called to be an ambassador, those are your prerequisites.